Psalms number three, and we are going to begin by turning to the book of Psalms chap chapter, uh, Psalm 65, <clears throat> and just look one, at one verse there, and then we're going to jump back into this thing of the, uh, what we've been discussing and what is written on the board here, divided into two parts for those who are on Skype with us from several different states. This top line right here, running right here, is the historical progression of uh, the house of God. And I think that's the top title on your handout that you have. And then below is the spiritual progression, and we're going to get into that a little more today. Um, and, yeah, and yet, we are still just preparing the way for some things. Um, one of the things that the Lord has really done this go-round is that he has shown me how much the tabernacle and the temple apply in the book of John, the gospel of John. And um, so I'm not going to reteach the gospel of John because we know that may take a while. But what I will do is we will pick a couple of chapters to pick on and to really bring out how these things relate <clears throat> to it. So, um, so first of all, let's read our scripture, Psalm 65 and verse 4. Blessed is the man whom thou choosest and causest to approach unto thee, that he may dwell in thy courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house, even of thy holy temple. And there I want you to just notice um, this, <clears throat> this emphasis on the house of God being the temple of God. Also, the temple of God being the house of God. And that was, that's why I entitled this The Historical and Spiritual Progression of the House of God because what we talked about last time was, excuse me, some of the things that we have on the board here. All right, so let's, uh, let's go back over a little bit of what we covered last time with the historical progression, meaning the progression as it relates historically primarily to Israel. Um, and that's why I started on your chart. And, and for, for those up there, I'm just basically explaining the, uh, the chart that they have in their hand. And that is, we're, we're beginning with Abraham. And the reason why I'm beginning with Abraham, the truth is, this goes all the way back to, you know, uh, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, or, or, or Noah, or Enoch, it goes back before that, but we're really sort of studying the, the spiritual progression of the house of God as related to Israel, and the first Jew was, that's right, you said it all correctly, Abraham, <laughs> and the second Jew was, never mind, <clears throat> Okay, so, and then uh, on, our, on your chart, and uh, as we move on down in time, then we come to the tabernacle, and that is the official title given to uh, the tent where God chose to come down and meet with his people. Now, did God meet with Abraham? Yes. Did God meet with Enoch? Yes. He, uh, uh, Enoch walked with God. Did, but... God did not dwell in their midst, right? Right? You know, because, okay, let's just picture it real quick. Here's Abraham. Oh, Lord, we praise you. We need you. Where's he looking? He's looking up in heaven. What's he doing? Does he need a big crowd? No, it's individual. It's totally something between him and God, but pretty much God who's far away, Right? And you have that all the way through up until Moses and, and particularly, and in fact, exactly at the moment that God initiated and separated Moses and said, come up here, I want to talk to you. And he started describing a new, completely brand new situation where God would not just come down from time to time, or you didn't just talk to God way up there, but rather God was going to come down in the midst of his people and dwell with his people. And in so doing, he would do that through the term we, that the scriptures use, a tabernacle. Okay, <clears throat> And uh, so 
Uh, then on your chart now, and I've got them both marked up here together, but on your chart they're separate and for, separate for a reason that I'll get into later. But uh, the next one is, is Shiloh, and then I put on the board here, it's Shiloh and the taking of the ark. So we got Abraham, Moses' tabernacle, and Shiloh, the taking of the ark. And let me, I, I just need to clar clarify something, Mallory. We were talking about this. Uh, you weren't saying that the ark, or, or that the ark was taken out of Gibeon. It was out of Shiloh, right? Yeah. Okay. So I thought. I, I just couldn't remember. I know we had that conversation, but uh, it's not important that we cover where all all it had been. <clears throat> okay. Um, so uh, Moses' tabernacle was set up in the wilderness, <clears throat> and the longest place that that tabernacle was with Israel was in the wilderness. And, and all that's significant. It's all going to come up spiritually later. So can anybody see, if, if these things are going to come up spiritually later, can anybody see the purpose for just knowing the scriptures? Can anybody see the purpose for even knowing the Old Testament? Because it's a shadow. It's, it's a picture. <clears throat> all right. So then, uh, uh, and, and, and let me just qualify here. Shiloh was a town in the land. So that means the tabernacle has actually come into the land, but then, uh, and, and, and dwelt there in the land, in Shiloh and Gibeon and several other places. But it was at Shiloh that the ark was taken. <clears throat> we'll get into all that. And then after it was taken for a while and the Philistines had it, um, David ends up getting the ark and bringing it not back to Shiloh or Gibeon or any of the places where it had dwelt in Moses' tabernacle, but he brought it to Mount Zion, or what he called my backyard, because that's where he lived. That's where his house was, and it was, he just put it in his backyard. All right. Well, another thing we discussed that I think is real, real important to realize is that David's tabernacle really isn't a different tabernacle than, than Moses' tabernacle. David's tabernacle is the Holy of Holies. Okay? Now, it may not be the exact same skin, you understand, because the, they didn't take the skin off of the Holy of Holies and lose it. They took the ark. But David built a tent, and the tabernacle that he had in his backyard that he all, the, I mean, you ought to read Psalms in light of this when he talks about, I love your tabernacle, I love your prison, I, love, I seek you, I go to the, you know, I go to your tabernacle to find you, you know, and all this kind of stuff. I mean, he goes on and on and on and on and on and how, how much he loved uh, the tabernacle of the Lord. Um, he's talking about, David's tabernacle. He's not talking about Moses' tabernacle. <clears throat> and, um, and I've never really figured it out, but I don't know that even David was alive when the thing got taken. <clears throat> I mean, there's some question there. And if he was, he probably was what we call out of country. <laughs> he was on the run from Saul. <clears throat> but anyway, the uh, point being... Uh, because that happened way over in 1 Samuel chapter 4, and it's not till I don't know, way down the road when, when they start bringing back the, the ark and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, that's not so important right this moment. Um, but we, what we're doing is we're identifying that in the New Testament, it talks about coming boldly. To the throne of grace. Well, folks, the throne of grace was the mercy seat. It's a mercy seat. All right? So, and it's not telling you to go through all of the utensils. It's literally telling you that, that there is an open door to the Holy of Holies where now you can boldly enter in. Now, you, you know that on one level, but maybe you've never really seen it in light of this Old Testament picture that David's tabernacle is really just the Holy of Holies, and that was the way David primarily related to the Lord. I mean, almost all of his life, 
Um, that's how he related to the Lord. And just in his older years was Solomon's temple completed, and he was a very old guy by the time that happened, and he got to see it and experience it. And he was the one who actually literally got the blueprint for it from God and gave it to his son who built it. His son built it. Solomon built it. He gets all the credit. But David saw the pattern from God. You tell me. I mean, I, I'd rather see the pattern let someone else build it. I mean, that's just my, my thing. Hear from God the reality instead of just putting, you know, putting it into, you know, a, a, a material sort of view. <clears throat> All right. And then, um, uh, <clears throat> and then Solomon's temple, finally, over here. And we said in the last class we're not going to cover all the other temples, but that Solomon's temple represents the highest glory of the temple in its um, permanence and in its gloriousness. In its permanence, because before that time, God dwelt in tents. And, and, and if you remember, that was part of the problem David had, you know. And, and we'll, we'll get into that later on, too. What was this thing that drove David's heart to build a temple over a tabernacle? Because a, a temple would be a progression of the house of God. You see? It'd be a progression. And if and maybe not all of you know the full have really, really read the scriptures about the building of Solomon's temple and the glory, but it was spectacular. It was glorious. It was incredible. It was, I mean, you know, the laver in the tabernacle was this brazen thing. The the laver in the temple, in fact, I think there were actually several of them, but it, it had it underneath big bulls and um, you know brass bull, and it was just huge you know and uh, everything about it was was just really um, uh, awe-inspiring <clears throat> or what we would say today awesome <clears throat> so uh, uh, so we see that in in uh, the beginning up until Moses' tabernacle, the relationship, and you see it on your chart there, was individual. Okay? And I even put it on the one below it, on the chart relating to the spiritual progression, but it, you know, God was in heaven. God was in his holy temple. And in fact, um, let's, let's look in Psalm 11. And let's hope I can remember which one this was. Psalm 11, yeah, verse 4. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids test the children of men. All right. So there you see a mention of a temple. You see God in heaven in his temple. You see that? Okay. So... They would pray, as it were, to God in heaven while he was in his temple. But then there was a progression. God said, I'm bringing that thing down. But when he first brought it down, he didn't bring it down as in a temple form. He brought it down in a tabernacle form. And the individual thing ended. And now it was not just a bunch of people in, in, in Egypt. It was the children of God, the children of Israel. It was the nation. And... Um, uh, they really were not a nation. He considered it a nation until they came out. And when they came out, they immediately went to Mount Sinai and this whole thing started. So they were, they were a people, but they were not a nation until they came out. <clears throat> and being a nation speaks of more than one, right? I mean, how many nations do you know is just one people? That, that's, that's stupid. Okay, so, <laughs> okay, I'm my own nation, <laughs> one nation under me. <clears throat> um, but there is, 
<laughs> there is uh, a, that progression, and it goes on. And uh, from there, it goes to uh, the fact that the, the ark was lost to the Philistines, but then David's tabernacle, and we talked about that, it was the uh, magnification of simply the holy of holies above all the other parts. And then the final thing was Solomon's temple, a permanent, a glorious manifestation of what God had in mind and a progression unto it. <clears throat> all right, now, for those up there, let's talk about the spiritual progression <clears throat> as I point to the chalkboard. The spiritual progression, <clears throat> and in your chart, uh, we start again with God in heaven. Let's see. <clears throat> and then uh, we're just going to go straight across according to what's on the board right now. God in heaven, then the incarnation, then the cross, then the resurrection, and then the body of Christ. And I'll explain that as we go because that can sound a little um, strange. Um, uh, bef before we do that, let's look a few, at a few more scriptures in Psalms before we go ahead and jump into the spiritual progression. Let's look in Psalm 27. And I want to give you just a couple of scriptures to help, uh, help solidify what we've said thus far. You know, because... If you don't found this on the Word of God, what do you got? You just got talk. And really, I don't want to just talk. I want to know the Lord. <clears throat> Psalm 27, verse 4. This is David speaking here. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. All right, let me ask you. What temple is that talking about? <clears throat> What, or what house of the Lord, let's just say it like that. Which one is that talking about? David's tabernacle. David's tabernacle, right, because that's where he primarily worshipped and loved and knew the Lord. It's not talking about Moses' tabernacle. You see, do you see why I'm doing this? Because it's important that just because something says the house of God, we don't automatically think Solomon's temple or we don't automatically think... Um, um, Moses' tabernacle. And also remember, there are places, and I'll show this when the time comes, but there are places in the New Testament where it does use interchangeably temple and tabernacle. Now, there are places that don't and is specifically trying to identify something. But just so you'll know, those terms can be used back and forth, and I'll even give you some scriptures to show that that is the case. <clears throat> All right, um, uh, let's see, let's, let's go to Hebrews, no, let's stay right here at, before we go too far away and then we can go, let's go to Psalm 68, <clears throat> Psalm 68 and verse 29. You there? How about you? Verse 29. Because of thy temple at Jerusalem shall kings bring presents unto thee. What do you think that, that's referring to? Solomon's temple. I think, now, you know, I think David is quoting this, but I think that is a reference to Solomon's temple because David usually, and this is just information, but it's good information, I think, he usually uses Zion as the reference for the mount upon which David's tabernacle rests, whereas he calls Jerusalem where Solomon is. So that's just some pointers to help you kind of work your way through this stuff so that you can know it. <clears throat> All right, um, and then uh, let's go to Hebrews chapter 9.
Hebrews 9. And uh, let's, let's just read verse 1 through 5. Hebrews 9. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and an earthly sanctuary, for there was a tabernacle made, the first in which was the lampstand and the table and the, uh, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary, and after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, in which was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant, and over it the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. All right, which tabernacle is this speaking of? Moses' Moses's tabernacle. But interestingly enough, hidden within that, is a secret tabernacle that a lot of people never see. It's David's tabernacle is actually mentioned, but in conjunction, while it is yet in conjunction with Moses' tabernacle, but identified as a separate tabernacle. All right, you want to see it? All right, verse 2. For there was a tabernacle made the first, the first meaning the first tabernacle. Are you following I will show, we're not done yet. For there was a tabernacle made, the first in which was the lampstand and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after that, the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. And actually, um, uh, it says, yeah, that's right. Which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant over it and goes into all of that kind of stuff. Um, it is identifying two tabernacles there. It's literally calling them tabernacles. Does everybody see it? Do I need to go over it again? Because it's there. Okay? Now verse 2 and verse 3. There was a tabernacle made, the first in which was, and after the second veil, the tabernacle which is called the Holy Saul, which had... All right? So, this is a New Testament scripture that is trying to help us to see that in God's mind, Moses' tabernacle and David's tabernacle are really two different tabernacles. And that's why in the New Testament, it calls it David's tabernacle in, in one place. Okay? Even though it's the Holy of Holies, it's called David's tabernacle. Even though it's David's tabernacle, it's still the Holy of Holies. All right? Now, um, now let's go to this uh, spiritual progression of the house of God. <clears throat> um, God in heaven, we've read the scripture that relates to that. <clears throat> but really, and I've got that related over here to Abraham and to, to all of those who worshiped individually. God in heaven, God is in his temple All's right with the world. But in Moses' tabernacle, the spiritual, remember, we're go, here's the historical, but now we're given the spiritual implications of it. In Moses' tabernacle, the spiritual reality from which the shadow of Moses' tabernacle represents is Jesus in the incarnation. Okay? Okay? Jesus in his incarnation. Jesus in his incarnation represents Moses' tabernacle. Okay? Um, and as the tabernacle of God, let's go through a couple of scriptures that, that'll show us this. Uh, let's go to John again. And as I said, we'll be bouncing in and out of John a lot for this course, because there I have seen the, 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 uh, the contrast of uh, the tabernacle and the, the temple. John 1, did I say that? John 1, 14. <clears throat> 
And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, there it is. Anybody have a different translation? Okay. Basically, this word, and, and he dwelt among us, is the words he tabernacled among us, the original Greek. Mallory, you got your Greek there? And what does it say? <gasps> My God, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, it just got established. He tabernacled among us. He, in his incarnation, and if you're not familiar with the word incarnation, it means when Jesus came to the earth in flesh. When he came to the earth in flesh, that's what the incarnation is. When he lived on this earth for 33 and a half years and ministered for three and a half years, that, that's the true reality of God coming down and being with us, or what we would call God with us. All right? And I don't have, let's see, that's in Matthew, I think. Let's, let's turn to Matthew. And I'm pretty sure it's chapter one. Yes. Uh, Matthew chapter one, and let's start at verse 18. All right, this is talking about the birth of Jesus. And you know how I know that? Because it says, now the birth of Jesus Christ was in this way. When, as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make a, pub a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now, all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and took unto him his wife. Uh, well, read verse 25 too. And knew her not till she had brought forth her, for, forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. All right. So my question is, in, in two different places in this, it says call his name Jesus in one place and the other place it says call his name Emmanuel. And then in the end, down in verse 25, the name that they picked or he picked, Joseph picked, was Jesus. What's going on there? Yes. Christ is the anointed one, but yes. Okay. Somebody else come in? Yes. Okay. It does say that. <laughs> I can't argue with that. Can you repeat it? No one can hear that one. What she said to me? Yes. The Bible says that he was and is and is to come. Can you argue with that? All right. Nobody, no one's arguing. Okay. Anybody else? <clears throat> well, um, first of all, the angel sent from God said, look, you're bring, she's bringing forth the, the son of God. Call his name Jesus. He knows from the Bible that the prophet said, call him Emmanuel. So when the day came to do it, he knew presently he had had a present encounter with God and God wants his name Jesus and Emmanuel must be not his name but that that is the reality because 
he said, the angel said, you're going to bring forth the Son of God. That's God with us, folks. All right? That is God with us more than a tabernacle being set down in the midst of Israel in the wilderness and calling that, uh, calling that, uh, calling that the tabernacle of God. They called it Moses' tabernacle. But Jesus was the tabernacle of God. The Father lived in Jesus. Okay? He was the clearest, most undeniable picture of the tabernacle of God in, in the Word of God. Okay? All right. So, um, now, <clears throat> that being said, <clears throat> the thought comes to me, well, how do we know that that is... Uh, a proper rendering of that. <clears throat> so let's look at a couple other scriptures just to, to establish this line of thought. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. <clears throat> All right, verse 1, this is Paul speaking. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle, now isn't that interesting? We'll, we'll explain what that means, but he's talking about the body. It'll be evident real quick. But isn't it interesting that he's using both house and tabernacle here? And what a coincidence that we're studying the historical and spiritual progression of the house of God. The house and tabernacle, one and the same. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. And for we that are in this tabernacle... Do groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for this same, very same thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, there it is, body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, willing rather to be absent from the body than to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. So <clears throat> we'll end there. And we'll, we just, what we see from this scripture is we see that some very familiar terms, especially to Jewish people, um, to the Jews of that day, and that was a temple, or in this case, tabernacle, and house, and house being the same um, as the tabernacle, and body being introduced as the house. Body being introduced as the house. Body being introduced as the tabernacle. Now remember, we're still working our way through this and we're just trying to lay all the foundation for this. We're not busting anything wide open quite yet. But we're, we're seeing Moses' tabernacle in light of the New Testament reality. All right, let's go to one more scripture over in 2 Peter so we can get this in the mouth of three, two or three witnesses. Corinthians was Paul and this is Peter. 2 Peter Chapter 1, verse 13. Well, we'll start at verse 12. Um, Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them and are established in the present truth, 
Yea, I think it fitting, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up, putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath shown me. <clears throat> All right, so here he's... Uh, um, He's exhorting the people of God. He feels that his time may be short. He was one of the original 12. He knew Jesus after the flesh, but now knows him after the spirit. His terminology has been transformed, hopefully because his mind has been renewed. Amen. Thank you. Be, well, and, and the reason, I mean, the reason why, because a lot of times we're so quick to change terminology. Oh, I love this Christ life message. Oh, I love this in Christ stuff. I love this Christ in you or Christ life. I, you know, all the, all the terminology uh, that we use and terminology has no power at all. Even if, even if, you know, even if I made it up, it has no power at all. I'm just as flaky as you. And, and as I look around, there's a few that are more flaky than me, but I'm flakier than some of you even. Uh, terminology, my God, we should shun the pursuit of terminology because it robs our souls, it robs our spirit of the reality of Christ and it makes us feel that we have something that we don't have, you know? And so we hear this stuff, we say, oh, Christ and him crucified and all that. Well, you know what? Let's, I mean, let's just, let's just say some of this terminology right here. Christ in you, you in Christ. Christ crucified, the preaching of the cross. Well, we didn't make that up. That's in the Bible, every ounce of that, right? So it's not a bad thing to say, but God forbid that we just grab the words and think that we know it or grab it because it's the popular terminology of the place and therefore you know, we're going to fit in. Don't fit in with us. Don't try to fit in with us. If you, I believe, you know, call me crazy. I believe if you fit in with Jesus, if you know the Lord, if you're really after the Lord, you'll fit in with, you know, at least three of us here. <laughs> and there'll be a flow of life because... It's not about New Creation Fellowship. It's not about Acts Bible School. It's not about Randy Nussbaum. It's not about any of that. It's about Jesus. It's about Jesus. It's about Jesus. And so, so, Paul, so Peter here has, has that same passion and that same desire. And, and uh, he sees, you know, he sees his life coming to an end. And, uh, you know, the little phrase came to me the other day that, you know, that, that he doesn't just want to be a candle that was lit for a while and then it burns down and it's over. He wants to be a torch that gets passed on. The life of it is Christ. That's what gets passed on. And you, you, it's not about you. It's not about what you're doing. It's not about what you did. It's not about who you know. It's not about who's who. It's only about hearts that say, Jesus, I love you, and, and I'm after you, and I want to know you, and I want your Holy Spirit to teach me, and I don't want to be religious, and I don't want to be a Pharisee. And, you know, can you imagine Paul talking about this stuff? Can you imagine the, because he, he admits, I was a Pharisee. I was highest in the religious realms. I was, um, as, as the Greek actually says there in Galatians, I was out distancing many of my brethren. What kind of language is that? That is an ambitious language even in the things of God. I was out distancing all my brethren in the Jews' religion. You notice by this time he's already left that off. And so he knows 
to call it what it is, the Jew's religion. That's, the, that's, that's what he calls it. He says, I was out distancing my brethren in the Jews' religion. And then he begins to talk about, but God began to reveal his son, not to me, but in me. Praise God. There's hope. There's hope for every one of us. But that, that hope of Christ in us depends on he must increase and we must decrease. And we've talked about it before, but there cannot ever be just an increase of Christ. There has to be the corollary of it, the, the decrease of us, because if you had a cup that was full and you wanted to put some more in it, you know, you can't put any more in it. You're full of yourself. You ever heard that terminology before? You're full of yourself. And so, you know, it's just real easy to, to get off on religion. It's real, it is. It's real easy to get off on terminology. It's real easy to jump the bandwagon of any group. It's not easy to press through the crowd like that woman with the issue of blood. Press through the crowd and go and just get hold of Jesus. You know, or like blind Bartimaeus. You gotta love the guy, you know? He heard Jesus was passing by and he starts screaming, Jesus, thou son of David, Jesus! And the disciples, you know, come over and go, dude, we don't act that way in church. We don't, we don't get loud like this, okay? We're a holy people. We, we wouldn't want to show any real passion and desire. Just, you know, hold your finger up like this and wave it. And maybe he'll spot you and come over. Well, I added that last little bit there, but that, you know. Um... He, you know, there's, a, there's an old hymn that says, Pass me not, old gentle Savior. Do not pass me by. While on others thou art calling. What is it? I missed a sentence. There. Do not pass me by. Pass me not, gentle Savior. Pass me not, old gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Well, I got news for you. Jesus is not going to pass blind Bartimaeus by. Okay. <laughs> He's not going to sit there and go, he, he passed me by. <laughs> My heart was really going, ah. you know, I guess that doesn't translate on our <laughs> vocal recording. <laughs> You know, I was really kind of whimpering, you know, and he, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't see me, he didn't stop. Uh, he stopped for blind Bartimaeus. He stopped for the woman with the issue of blood that stopped him on his way to do something for someone else. And Jesus stopped and turned around and said, what can I do for you? You know? Same with blind Bartimaeus. No, stop. And, and everything within him wants Jesus. He's not just going, well, there's that guy. He's famous. You know? Maybe he'll, get, maybe he'll feed us. Maybe we'll get some bread out of this and some loaves and fishes or something. I heard tell. You know? No. He wants to see. He wants to see. Nisi and I were talking about this the other day. It was real precious. She came over when I was in the throes of my surgery and sat down and just had some questions about some things she was going to be sharing and uh, talked about blindness. Do <coughs> you remember that? Probably don't, but it, well, yeah. talked about blindness. And, <clears throat> and uh, she said something like, you know, 
I know I don't see. And I know that if I see something, only God opened my eyes because I am blind. And so then we, we talked about the fact that um, a person that has been blind all their life person that's been blind all their life and then they see they know that they you know they see anything they go I I couldn't have seen that without the Lord you know like that guy that and there's no way but a person that sees and remember Jesus said that didn't he he said because you say you see then you see not but if you said you were blind I will open your eyes but what we do is we don't, I wouldn't want to admit I'm blind. Well, no, I think you would. <laughs> and, and I just saw, I mean, imagine, imagine that here's the picture I got from, from our conversation is I, I imagined a blind person that basically is walking through life blind until he gets to, let's say, um, uh, uh, I'm just going to use material, natural things to help explain this. But he gets to his wife whom he hasn't seen, and God opens his eyes, and he sees her. And it just, he just breaks down, weeping. And then he doesn't see anymore, but he still sees her. You know what I'm saying? Are you following me? So then he goes, and, you know, he's, he, he, he sees, you know, he's, he's blind, and he's walking. And then he's, God opens his eyes, and he sees his child. And then, you see what I mean, and all these, and then he sees this beautiful sunset, but then he's blind again. And the only way that he's going to see anything is if God opens his eyes along the way. Well, when that person says publicly, look, I'm blind. I don't see anything unless God opens my, when he says that, oh my God, there's just power behind it. Whereas we walk around, we go, you know, we see all this stuff, and we go, well, I'm blind. I, you know, I just don't see unless God opens my eyes. Are you following the difference? <laughs> huge difference. Huge difference. And when it comes to religion, religion is so quick to open our eyes to things that God isn't opening our eyes to. We think that that, remember we talked about at Turner Falls, what growth is, what people think growth is. And we don't. We don't really walk in blindness trusting him to open our eyes. You know, we go to the word and go, oh, I know that scripture. I saw Jesus there. I remember when I was in Bible school, my Bible from Bible school um, was covered with notes. Three years of, of studying and then my own personal studying and everything. And I mean, I was always in it. And it was, you know, pages were coming out and tear stained and all this stuff. But I mean, I had all these notes written all, you know. And I remember when we graduated, we went to the mission field and we were there. And I remember reading my Bible and going, you know what? I can't even see the word of God here for all my notes. And I automatically have it figured out what this is going to say. I took that Bible and I put it away. And I said, I need to get me a new one. <laughs> because I, I think, you know, I think I got this thing all figured out. And I'm still blind. And let me tell you, one scripture, just any, any scripture that God chooses to, he could open your eyes over and over and over and over and over. I mean, when I was in Bible school, he did that to me in Romans 7. I couldn't believe how many times he'd open my eyes to stuff in Romans 7. I'd go, I've read this a million times. I'm an idiot. And he's, angels are going, yay. He got it. I'm blind. So, so I say all that, and we need to stop. But I say all that just to say, uh, may, may the Lord grant us the, the brokenness and humility to even see how blind we are. 
because we'll never get this. I mean, what I just shared, we'd go, oh, and then walk out and go, I know everything. <laughs> I mean, it's true. We, it's just the way human nature is. God grant us the brokenness, and, and a lot of times the brokenness, what it takes, the brokenness, oh, you got to go through some junk. You got to, you, you know, we think that the most spiritual people are the people that's never been through anything. Ha! I say they're not spiritual at all. I say they got a lot of head knowledge and they know a lot of stuff and, they, and they're really good at protecting their image. But I believe God breaks you down so he can build you back up again. I believe he does. And I think a lot of times when we're being broke down, we think this is the end. Some of you haven't been there yet. But when you're going through it and it feels bad, you're going, I, 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 I'm, I'm done. <laughs> Anybody ever said that? <laughs> I have. I'm done with this. I've had it up to here. No, up to here. All the way up to here. Well, who's going who's gonna to bring you up out of it? The same God who smote you will heal you. Don't ever leave him. Just, you know, you can say, I don't like this and I don't like that, but I'm trusting you. <laughs> Amen. All right, let's take a break and we'll come back. <laughs> 